The Science of Simple Spans. Let's learn about the science of simple spans. And this information was provided by Glenn Mathewson, who is a consultant and educator with buildingcodecollege.com. Maximum joist span seems like a pretty simple concept, but there's obviously a natural limit to how far wood can span without breaking under a particular load. But when inspecting a house, we don't want to see any floor joist getting anywhere near that breaking point. We don't even want a joist to bend all that much. So when we talk, talk about maximum joist spans as the International Residential Code defines them, we're not really talking about pushing things to the limit. We're largely talking about what it takes to have a functional floor, one that doesn't overly bounce or won't rattle when we walk on it. Check out this sketch about joists, spans, load, compression, and tension. Loading a joist creates bending stress that puts wood fibers at the top in compression and at the bottom in tension. The height of the joist and the species of the lumber affects how well it handles these stresses. Taller joists and denser species deflect less and allow it to span farther. The IRC span tables make it easy for contractors and inspectors to pick up a joist to bridge a simple span, one without intermediate supports or cantilevers, or to get the biggest simple span out of the wood available. But span is just one of many rules relating to joists. There are other rules for blocking, notching, and bearing lengths. And all of these rules can be read alone, but when taken together and mixed with a little science, they start to make sense, not as arbitrary rules, but as the means to reach the expected ends. Home inspectors don't need an engineering degree to understand how these various joist-related provisions in the code work together. So let's discuss them informally. The first step in designing a floor system for a house is to determine how much you expect it to support, and that's load. The heavier the load imposed on a joist or beam, the shorter the distance it can safely and functionally span. This shortening isn't because the code is concerned about the floor breaking. It doesn't want it to bend too much. The flexion, rather than strength, is the foremost limiter to span in conventional wood frame construction. Maximum deflection is the most a building system or component is allowed to bend under its maximum design load. Floors have historically been held to L divided by 360, where you divide the joist length in inches by 360 and you get the maximum deflection allowed for a given span. We can refer to table R301.7 in the IRC. We can also take InterNACHI's free online structural issues course for home inspectors to calculate deflection of a joist. As an example, for any 14 foot joist, the deflection limit is about a half an inch. That's 168 divided by 360, approximately. The L divided by 360 deflection limit for floor joists exists for at least two good reasons. One, it should prevent the drywall or the plaster ceiling below from cracking. It's also about how stiff the occupant expects the floor to feel when they walk on it. While a trampoline can support the 40 pound per square foot live load prescribed for residential living areas, it would make a rather impractical kitchen floor. If more deflection than L360 were allowed, the allowable spans would increase, but the floor wouldn't be as stiff. If you span less than the maximum allowed for a given joist, it will deflect less and feel stiffer. So what gives a joist stiffness? When a load is put on a joist, the fibers in the top of the joist compress, and those in the bottom are under tension. And in the middle, what engineers call the neutral plane, these forces diminish to zero. The ability of the wood fibers to resist being scrunched by compression or stretched out by tension directly translates to how much a joist deflects and is why denser wood species can span farther. They're better at resisting the stretching and the scrunching and therefore they deflect less. Still, height can make up for the deficiencies of a species. The more mass is distributed away from the center of a joist or toward the tension and compression edges, in other words, the taller the joist, the better it resists deflection. Thus, a 2x10 can span farther than a 2x8 of the same grade and species. And this is also why I joists can span extreme distances without a major increase in depth. Much 
if not most, of their mass is in the top and bottom flanges. These tension and compression stresses are also what moves the load to the ends of the joist for transfer to whatever's below, typically beams, hangers, or plates. And for this transfer of load to work, the joist must be held in a state of stress. A joist not stressing is a joist deflecting. Joists will lay down on the job if permitted to, and a joist laid flat like decking can't span very far without bending along its thickness. Given the way houses are built, that isn't what happens. Instead, joists, especially when overspanned or overloaded, try to flop over in the middle of the span. Joist thickness is a large part of what presents this kind of flop. While the height handles the stress, the thickness of the joist helps keep it upright and handles the stress. The ratio between thickness and height is important and most obvious in beams, where additional plies and larger sawn thicknesses are common. Sawn joists, on the other hand, no matter how tall, are always one and a half inches thick. So even though a sawn joist can handle more stress as it gets taller, it also gets harder to keep it upright. Thanks to other code provisions and common sense, the width of the joist doesn't have to do the job alone. Blocking, rim joists, or joist hangers at the ends and bearing locations are what ultimately keep the joist upright and stressed. R502.7 in the code will help. Other than hangers, which also support the vertical load, these other features do almost exclusively that. Blocking and rim joists resist rotation. When the height of the joist compared to its width is greater than 212, the width can't hold the joist upright along their length, and bridge blocking is required within the span to prevent the joist from rolling over. Home inspectors are not code inspectors, but home inspectors can Get out the code book and look at the science. If you want a stiffer floor with less deflection, you just need better stress management. You could use larger joists height, denser wood species, or closer joist spacing, or you could add bridge blocking with the span to reduce mid-span rotation of the joist. So let's say you have a 2x10 joist that's slightly overspanned. Its primary failure is excessive deflection. And the usual reason for that is it wants to flop over in mid-span. The same principles that stiffen a floor to above code deflection limits can stiffen an overspan floor up to the deflection limit. The code won't tell you this, but we will. Bridge blocking can bring slightly overspan joists to within deflection limits. And that's a more reasonable alternative recommendation than to replacing the 2x10s with 2x12s. After deflection, Shear is the next stress that joists need to be able to handle, but it typically isn't a major consideration in wood joists. Shear stresses are distributed opposite of bending stresses. They are greatest along the horizontal center of the joist, that neutral plane, and increase towards the ends. Shear failures in sawn joists typically appear as cracks that start at the ends and propagate along the neutral plane, in other words, along the grain. And this kind of failure would be problematic because two small joists aren't equivalent to one big joist. Each smaller piece deflects more than one big one would, but it's highly unusual for a sawn joist to fail in shear along its length. Shear across the grain is even rarer, if not unheard of, because of the way the grain is oriented. It's much easier to split wood along the grain than it is to chop across the grain, right? Research has shown joists will fail in bending long before they fail in shear. Which is why, despite the shear stresses being largest at the end of the joist, the IRC allows joist ends to be notched up to one quarter of the depth of the joist. No notches are allowed in the middle third of the joist, where the bending stresses are the greatest. And in the rest of the joist, where bending stresses are smaller, they're limited to one-sixth of the joist depth. Holes, meanwhile, are allowed two inches away from the edges, anywhere in the span which tells you how little there is to worry about when it comes to shear stresses. We also have to think about bearing. Once joists are loaded, they have to transfer the load vertically. The key here is preventing the joist or the member that the joist is bearing on from crushing. Wood crushes more easily across the grain, like where the ends are located, than it does parallel with the grain, such as a post. The size of the bearing area required to prevent crushing is directly related to the strength of the joist, what it's bearing on, 
and the total load being transferred. Distributing the load over a greater area reduces the load on any one point, which can in turn allow for greater loads. It's just like how snowshoes distribute your weight to keep you from sinking in the snow. This is another engineering fundamental the IRC simplifies. For joists bearing on wood or metal, section 502.6 of the code requires the full width to bear with at least one and a half inches of length. This minimum area of wood necessary to transfer the loads that a floor designed using the IRC's prescriptive tables can generate without overstressing the joist and crushing its ends. The minimum bearing length on concrete is three inches, but this longer length isn't about the wood, it's about the concrete. A joist bearing on concrete creates stresses that can cause the corner of the concrete or masonry to crack and spall or break off under the joist. And the three inches of required bearing spreads the load over a greater area to reduce the chance of spalling and leaves enough area behind the compromised edge for the joist to bear safely if it does spall. This information was provided by Glenn Mathewson, who is a consultant and educator with buildingcodecollege.com. I'm Ben Gramico from InterNACHI, that's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors at nachi.org. Thank you for learning about the science of simple spans. Thank you.